turn with me in your Bibles, please, to 1 Kings and chapter 12. And we read from verses 25 to 33. That is on page 316 in the Church Bible. 1 Kings chapter 12, page 316. We read from verse 25 to the end of the chapter. You will recall that Jeroboam has rebelled with the ten tribes against Rehoboam. And we read that once that had taken place, that then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the half of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two cars of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set up one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines of the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burnt incense. Let's pray. Lord, we believe that you have given us the Holy Scriptures. And when we read events like these and examples like these, they are written for our learning. In order that we may be warned, in order that we may be instructed. And Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit tonight you would come and help the preacher to preach plainly and clearly what is here, help those of us who listen to hear and to receive what we have here in Scripture and to realize together what an enormous sin Jeroboam committed. Our God, we pray that as a consequence of what we hear tonight, we may strive on toward holiness and toward heaven and be turned away from our sin unto Christ. Lord, we ask it in his name. Amen. On the surface of things, you might, reading this passage of scripture, judge Jeroboam's actions to be the actions of a shrewd politician following the advice that was given to him in verse 28. He was bent, it seems, on preserving his own life and on preserving the new kingdom. And we might be tempted to congratulate Rehoboam for his shrewd political tactfulness. But I would suggest to you that that is reading the scriptures with a carnal mind. That is, without the spirit of God. The scripture, which is the voice of the living God, identifies, however shrewd this political move may have been, identifies that move and that action as sin. We read in verse 30, Now this thing became a sin. 
for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. That is the setting up of these golden calves of Bethel and Dan. If we turn over a chapter 2 to verse 16 of chapter 14, we read there of Jeroboam that he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned and who made Israel sin. Chapter 15 and verse 30. Speaking of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned and by which he had made Israel sin because of his provocation with which he had provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is breaking God's commandments. And what Rehoboam did and the consequences of what he did were sin against God who had redeemed his people out of Egypt. This was not then simply a human disaster. It was that, but it was far more than a mere human disaster. This is sin and it is against God. And tonight I want to look at three things. I want to look with you at the causes of Jeroboam's sin, the characteristics of Jeroboam's sin, and the consequences of Jeroboam's sin. But I want to begin with the last. I want to begin with the consequences of Jeroboam's sin. Why begin with the consequences? Why begin with the end? Isn't that a bit back to front? Well, yes it is. But I have a very specific reason for doing that. It is in order that you and I will pay far more attention to the causes of his sin and the characteristics of his sin when we realise precisely what the consequences were. I want you to come away from tonight with a sense of hatred for sin and the sins that Jeroboam committed. I want you to set up a careful watch in your own heart that you might not walk in the ways of Jeroboam. Satan is our arch enemy and what he loves to do is to minimise sin, to trivialise it and say it's not as serious as you think it is. Uh, you, you know, you're going over the top. It's not bad as bad as you think. It's not really serious. It's only a little thing. Make no mistake, Jeroboam's sin was a great sin. And we dare not trivialise it. It had terrifying consequences for him and for the nation of Israel, the ten tribes. We read in verse 29 that Jeroboam set up golden calves in Bethel and Dan. And that became a sin and the people went to worship. If you read through, and we will be working our way through for some time yet, I guess, through 1 Kings and perhaps even into 2 Kings, and you will find a repeated phrase and set of phrases with regard to what Jeroboam did. We've already referred to two of them in chapter 14 and verse 16 and chapter 15 and verse 30. Indeed, there are 20 or so more references through 1 and 2 Kings indicating that he was the man who made Israel sin. What Jeroboam started was never removed from the nation of Israel. It became an established pattern of wickedness. It became known as the way of Jeroboam. He did evil in God's sight. And such and such a king walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now Jeroboam was the first king of these ten tribes. If we move on 200 years more or less and 20 kings later on to the last king, Hoshea. If we turn to 2 Kings and chapter 17, keeping your finger in 1 Kings 12, but in 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 20 to 23, we read of the final consequences of Jeroboam's sins. 
Remember you've travelled 200 years and you've gone through 20 Israelite kings. But what do we find here now is the end of the kingdom of Israel. Israel is carried away captive to Assyria. And notice what it says beginning in verse 20. The Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them from his sight. For he tore Israel from the house of David and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they did not depart from them, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. Notice the phrase in verse 21. Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord. He made them commit a great sin when he erected these new places of worship and these new gods, the, go the, the, the bulls at Bethel and Dan. And notice again, it underlines it. Israel walked in the sins of Jeroboam. This idolatry, this false worship. They did not depart. For 200 years they carried on that tradition. And then God removed them out of his sight. Now those phrases ought to weigh heavily in our hearts and minds. Can you think of many greater sins than the sin of Jeroboam, driving the people away from following the Lord, turning them away, sowing the seeds of apostasy, sowing the seeds of their own destruction, so that God would come and turn his face away from them and cast them among the nations of the world. Can you contemplate anything as serious as this? Bringing down the wrath and the judgment of God on a people who were once the people of God whom he had redeemed out of the land of Egypt. I would suggest it ought to send a few cold shivers down the back of your spine. Make you afraid. Should Christians ever be afraid? Yes, you should be afraid of sin. Afraid of offending God. Afraid of being responsible for turning others away from God. Yourself turning away from God. From serving Him. What if I stood up here and preached a false Christ? What if I began to introduce elements into our worship that were foreign to what the Word of God says? What if I was responsible for turning you away from the gospel of Jesus Christ? What if you were responsible for turning the next generation, your own children, away from the truth because you no longer held to it? Having professed it, you turned away from it. There are preachers, and there have always been preachers, but there seem to have been many more in our nation in the last century or so who have scorned the Bible, who have scorned the miracles of Christ, who have scorned the teaching of hell and of judgment, who have scorned the penal, substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, who have belittled sin and said, no, we're not as bad as that, we're really quite good. And they have led people no longer to believe in this book and to turn them away from the truth. It's a terrible thing to ruin the souls of thousands. And that is what Jeroboam did. He ruined their souls. 
He turned them away. He drove them away from serving the Lord. That is the consequences of his sin. I don't know if you had realised that before or not. But that is the case. And if that is the consequence of his sin, then we need to ask our question then, well, where did it all begin? How did it come about that Jeroboam was responsible for such a great sin? Well, then let us look secondly at the cause of Jeroboam's sin. We read in verse 26 and verse 27 of 1 Kings 12, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now don't gloss over that first phrase in verse 26. Jeroboam said in his heart. He's talking to himself initially. This is what he said to himself. No one else at first perhaps heard this. It was later on he sought advice and made what he had thought in his own mind and heart more public. But what is happening on the inside, what's going on in this man's mind and in his heart that is invisible to you and to me, but now God has made it known. It's here in the Word of God. It's in his heart. That's where the root problem begins. It was the same with Solomon, we found. And his heart was strangely set against God. He loved those foreign women. And he clung to them in love. And his wives turned away his heart. Well now Jeroboam is saying in his heart he is afraid. He's afraid of losing the kingdom back to Rehoboam. He's afraid that the people will turn back because of their loyalty to Rehoboam. And he's afraid for his own life. They might kill me. And they might go back. He's afraid. He's fearful. He is anxious. Now, that is interesting in the light of what the prophet Ahijah had said to him initially when Ahijah came to him and said, you are going to be king over the ten tribes of Israel. You remember he tore his cloak into twelve pieces and gave ten to Jeroboam. If you go back, it's on the same page in my Bible, but if you go back to chapter 11 and verse 38, this is the word of the Lord that was spoken to Jeroboam by Ahijah. Verse 37, to put the context, I will take you, Jeroboam, and you shall reign over all your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did, then I will be with you, and build for you an enduring house as I built for David, and will give Israel to you. Now compare that with the words, or rather with the thoughts of Jeroboam. In verse 27, if these people go up to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem, then the half of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. You see where his fear has taken him? His fear has taken him a long way away from what Ahijah said to him as the word of the Lord. He is afraid and he is not listening. Now he is shut out. He doesn't believe the words of the Lord spoken to him by Ahijah, which saying, I will make you an enduring house if you follow me, if you heed my commandments. I will give Israel to you. There's no way it's going to go back to Rehoboam. But Jeroboam does not believe that. He does not believe the word of the Lord to him. 
And he did not seek after God. And he did not plead the promise of God. Instead, he is afraid. And then he goes and seeks other advice. Human advice. What shall I do in this set of circumstances? How shall we resolve this? What is it best to do for myself and for the kingdom to preserve it? God has already told him what he will do for him. But that's not good enough for Jeroboam. He shuts that out and seeks other counsel. And we learn from that something which is very, very important. That all turning away from God all embracing of what is sinful, what is false, begins when we stop believing the Word of God. Whether it is commandments of God or whether it is the promises of God. When we shut out the Word of God and begin listening to our own fears and anxieties and doubts. And when we pull in other unwise counsel. And then we make our own decisions about how best to preserve our life and promote our interests and the interests of those things which concern us. We have turned away from God. That's what happened with this man. Here is the cause of Jeroboam's sin. It begins with his own mind and it begins with his own heart and his own thoughts and the fear that is there as a consequence of not believing and trusting in God. That's the starting point. Here is the beginning of the production line of evil. The rejection of God's word, the fear that came as a consequence and he is led then away from following after God. Now what is happening here is not unusual. It's how Satan lured Eve from serving God. Has God said? Remember how the devil came? Has God said Eve? He began to sow doubts in her mind about the truthfulness of the word of God. Now Jeroboam had put the word of God to one side. It's as if God had never said those things. He discounted God's promises and God's provision. But it is not unusual. This is the way sin works. This is the way that Satan works. Someone has rightly said that fear is faithlessness. Fear is something that is of the flesh. Fears take you away from God. Fears, doubts and anxieties take you away from God. Rob you of the ability to act and to reason and to think clearly and blind you to the way of obedience, to the way of duty and to the promises and the commands of God. It pushes them out of the picture. That is what had happened to Jeroboam. Isn't it true that sometimes, too often perhaps, you run into trouble because you panic in a situation? You panic. You are afraid. You listen to your own thoughts. You listen to your own fears. And you don't trust in God. And then you're prompted into action by those fears. And not by obedience to the word of God. Is that true? Let me give you some biblical examples. Abraham was afraid when he met Ahimelech, the king. He was afraid for his wife's safety. So what did he do? She's my sister. He lied. It was half, I can't say it was half truth, but it was partly true. She was related to him, but she was his wife. But he was trying, he was afraid. He says, there's no fear of God in this place. 
And I've got to do something to protect Sarah. And that's what he did. He did it more than once. David. David was afraid. Saul is going to catch up with me one day and he'll kill me. So what did he do? He goes off to the Philistines of all people. And among the Philistines he gets himself into all kinds of trouble and has to play the fool and pretend he is a madman and let all the saliva run down his beard. Why? Because he was afraid. Now, the sins of Abraham and of David did not lead to the way of Jeroboam. Jeroboam took the whole thing a whole stage further. Abraham was recovered. David was recovered. Jeroboam was not. There may be some examples that are closer to home. Here's a young man. Here's a young woman. Now oh, they feel as if they're getting on a little bit and they haven't found a man or a woman with whom they can enter into a relationship that will end in marriage. A Christian man. A Christian woman. The Bible says you are to marry in the Lord. But you can't find someone in the Lord. And in a moment of fear and panic, and I know people, and you know people, have entered into a relationship which is disobedience to God. That's fear. That's fear. And it's disobedience to God. Let me come a little closer to home. Our government is about to consider again the whole matter of whether children should be smacked. There is a great deal of child abuse. There is no proof that they will reduce child abuse if they ban smacking. You only need to look at the statistics in Sweden. But, in bringing up your children, you might be afraid that you will drive your children away and turn them away from you if you smack them, if you verbally reprove them and smack them and make them cry. But God's word says that verbal reproof carried out in love and the rod of correction again administered in love will deal with the sins of your children. Those are the God-appointed ways of raising your children. There is a proverb, one of the proverbs, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it away from him. That is God's way. But you may say, oh, well, I'm afraid that if I do that, then I will turn my child away from me. You see what happens? And you can abandon then the word of God because of your fears. That's the kind of thing that Jeroboam is thinking. You see, where did it start? It started in your mind. It started in your heart. You were thinking, well, if I do this, then this might happen. And instead of listening to the word of God, you then implement something which is contrary to the word of God. Now again, it may not end up in the way of Jeroboam. But it's the beginning of his sin. It's the beginning of his sin. And he compounded his sin. And what he did affected not just Jeroboam, but the whole nation. But he made Israel to sin. And he made Israel to sin for some 200 years. And the consequence was that God turned his face away from them and rejected them and cast them away into exile in Assyria. Now, when Jeroboam began to say to himself, the kingdom might return to the house of David, do you think that he was thinking about, well, I don't know what the consequences will be, the nation will be carried away into Assyria, into exile. And that was a 
That was never, that thought never entered into his head. But you can see then the danger of where this sin begins. You'll never see the consequences. You may not live to see the consequences. Jeroboam didn't live to see all the consequences of his sin. But you set in motion a whole pattern, a whole way of life that will have disastrous consequences because it is sin. But having seen the consequences, having seen the beginnings, the causes of his sin, let us look at the characteristic of Jeroboam's sin. Again, it looks as if he's acting shrewdly and wisely. He's playing good politics. He builds Shechem. He builds Penuel. He defends the city. He defends the nation. He's protecting himself. But then, with those fears in his heart, the kingdom may return to Rehoboam. Having rejected the word of God and followed his fears and sought the advice of others, there are four things that he did. And on each occasion, and this com really compounds his sin, on each occasion he followed the evil inclinations of his heart having already rejected the word of God from Ahijah with regard to God saying I will build your kingdom I will be with you and build you an enduring house having rejected that word he now continues in that path and on each of these four occasions where he acts he rejects the words and the commands of the Lord. And indeed, according to verse 33, the fourth of these, we have the phrase there in the middle of the verse, which he, the things which he devised in his own heart. Things he devised in his own heart. He didn't consult with God. He didn't consult a prophet. He didn't turn back to the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures such as he had them, the laws of Moses. He made up a religion for Israel that God had not sanctioned. Notice in verses 28 to the end, the repetition of the word made, Jeroboam made. Verse 28, the king asked advice. Jeroboam made two cars of gold and said to the people. And then in verse 31, he made shrines. Verse 32, Jeroboam ordained or made a feast. On the fifteenth day of the eighth month. Verse 33. He made offerings on the altar. It's all Jeroboam. It's all the inclinations of his own heart. What were the four things he did? Well it's not difficult to extract them from the text. First of all. He sets up golden calves in Bethel and Dan. Calves were. These bulls. These calves were symbols of of fertility and power. Now he may well have attributed the power of God to them. But you see what he says. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. You heard those words before. Aaron. Aaron did this when Moses was in the mount. Made these golden calves, these golden bulls. And he says in verse 28 to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. You need a homemade religion. Enough of this Jerusalem business. You've got a new king, new places of worship. But you see, he's doing all this out of fear. He's got to keep the people here. He can't let them go to Jerusalem to worship. They might not come back. They might prove disloyal to him. So he'll invent his own religion. There's a certain ruthlessness about him. Disregarding God. It's not simply a matter of inconvenience to go up to Jerusalem. It's not very many miles from Bethel to Jerusalem. Even if we say he had good intentions, and I don't believe we can, and saying, well, the bulls would help us to focus on the power of God. They were bulls. This was disobedience to the commandment of God. You will not make any carved image that is a likeness of God, of any creature. And he disregarded that. 
Don't you find yourself groaning within you and saying, Jeroboam, what are you doing? How could you do this thing? Don't you remember what happened when Moses was in the mountain? When Aaron made those two golden calves? Well, Moses was actually receiving the Ten Commandments. Meeting with God in the mountain. Don't you remember what happened? How Moses came down and smashed those commandments? And then he ground the golden calves and made them drink of all the material that had been ground down. How could you do this, Jeroboam? But you see, you should not now be surprised. You may groan. But you see, his heart was afraid. You know why he did this. His heart was afraid. He set himself, he turned against God. And he continued now to turn against God. He wasn't thinking straight. Fear had driven straight thinking out of his mind. Fear had driven obedience out of his mind. He wasn't even prepared to acknowledge the commandments of God. He was going to rewrite history. And establish a new religion, a new cult in Bethel and Dan. It's a reckless course of action. And it says in verse 30, this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. The whole thing was false. God had not commanded it. But besides the golden calves in Bethel and Dan, verse 31, he now built shrines on the high places. Open air worship. Rejecting, as he already had done, Deuteronomy 12, there's to be one place. When you come into the land, there's to be one place of worship, the place that I choose. You will not worship me anywhere else. Jeroboam turns away from it. And then again, the third thing, verse 31, he appointed priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. And what had God said about the priesthood? To be the sons of Levi. Whose rod was it that budded? It was Aaron's rod. They were the ones, Aaron's Levites were to be the priests. Jeroboam says, no, we'll make priests from all the classes of all the people. They don't have to be Levites. We'll rewrite God's word. God had rejected other men as priests. Didn't seem to matter to Jeroboam. And then, fourthly, he appointed his own days and feasts of worship and sacrifices. He made the 15th day of the 8th month special. God had never made that date special. God had made other days special, but not that one. He reinvented the calendar. He changed the dates. Nothing in the law of Moses about that date. And expressly says, this is the devising of his own heart. You see then, this is simple. It's there, isn't it? Clear. I've not told you anything that isn't in the text. At every point he rejected what God had commanded. The pattern that was set when he rejected the word of God that was given to him by Ahijah and he allowed those fears to come into his heart and now he's bent on this pattern of self-preservation, the preservation of the kingdom, in complete and utter defiance to everything that God has commanded regarding his worship. And by so doing, he compounds his sin, leads the people into sin, drives them away from the living God, and brings God's anger and just judgment eventually down upon this people. And everything that he has done and the religion that he has created is false because God has not sanctioned it. It's all human invention. It's all nothing. All the outward forms of worship are there it looks like the real thing, may even sound like the real thing, but God says it is sin, it is evil, it is an abomination. You are provoking me to anger. You are offering to me things that I have not commanded you. 
I have not sanctioned this. Was it not the same in Christ's day? Matthew chapter 15. You've made the words, you've made the commandments of God of no effect by your traditions. And Christ there in Matthew chapter 15 reminds these, his contemporary Jews that they have done precisely what Isaiah did before. Verse 7 of chapter 15. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near me with their mouth. They honour me with their lips and their heart their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's what Jeroboam did. His heart was far away from God. He just went on consistently rejecting the word of God. And what he set up was totally of his own devising the doctrines and the commandments of men. And God says, I'm not interested. I reject such things. And not only that, but it provokes me to anger. It was the same thing in Paul's day. Along came these Jews who said, well, it's great to see all these Gentiles in the kingdom of God, but they need to be circumcised. And Paul says effectively, over my dead body. No way are they going to be circumcised. No way are you going to confuse grace with law. No longer are you going, no, no way are you going to confuse and muddy the pure waters of the gospel with human traditions that God has not required. And the same thing is true today. When the worship of God is founded upon things which God has not sanctioned and commanded. When men and women introduce their own ideas and their own heart's devisings, men and women today want to follow the subjective feelings of their own hearts and establish patterns based upon what they think in their own minds and what you end up with, a kind of entertainment. This is what I want, this is what makes me feel good. And that's the kind of thing that happens. But what has happened? There's a rejecting of God's word. John Calvin once said that the human heart is a factory of idols. When a human heart is left to its own devising, it will manufacture idolatry. That is why we need the word of God. That is why God says, this is the way you are to worship me. What are the things that we can learn from this sad, sad account in 1 Kings 12? First of all, I would suggest to you there is a need for us to learn to listen, to discern and to be obedient in our hearts to the Word of God. And I choose what I say carefully. We need to listen, we need to discern, we need to obey from the heart what God has said in his word. We need a heart that is full of faith. We need a heart that is full of ears, if I may put it that way. Ears to hear what God says and what God requires in his word. The faith that trusts in God and believes all that he has said the horrible thing about Jeroboam is that he turned away. He pushed away the word of God from him. Compare Joshua with Jeroboam. Joshua, you remember, at the very beginning of the book of Joshua. This is what the Lord says to Joshua. In verse 3, Every place, Joshua, that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, and so on and so forth. No man, verse 5, shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage.' 
Verse 7, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And what did Joshua do? He acted upon that. And what was the consequence? They went in and they possessed the land. Precisely as God said they would. Was God with Joshua? Absolutely. Did Joshua seek to obey the Lord on the, in the main? Yes, he did. He made some mistakes. They learned as they went along. But Joshua, first and foremost, was a man who was strong. A man who was courageous. A man who obeyed God. A man then who carried on his life and led Israel in the way of prosperity, in the way of success. So that they went in and tribe after tribe after tribe acquired their inheritance. So that we find in Joshua chapter 21 and verse 43 the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. And Joshua was the man who led them in that triumph and in that success. He obeyed. He listened. He discerned. He obeyed from the heart the word of God. Jeroboam, what did he do? He took one step away from the word of God and then he took another and another and another and another. And he brought total disaster upon the nation of Israel. These things are written for our learning, brethren. The danger of not believing God's word. But there is a warning also. We need to listen and discern and have an obedient heart. There is also a warning. What is sobering and terrifying about Jeroboam is this. That he's not afraid of sin. He doesn't seem to be afraid of sin. He doesn't seem to be afraid of disobeying God. He's afraid that the nation is going to go back to serve Rehoboam. That's his fear. But he doesn't even have any fear of offending God and disobeying God. He refuses, and I'll put it that strongly, he refuses to trust in God. God made a promise to him through Ahijah. But he refused to trust in God. There seemed to be no fear of God in the heart of this man. Even though a prophet had spoken the word of God to him. And idolatry and apostasy is the sad result of a man who is not afraid of sin. But for the grace of God, if you were left to yourselves, and the fears of your own hearts and the sins of your own minds that's where you and I would end up this is a man without the grace of God in his heart this is a man who has consistently turned against God turned against his Redeemer turned against his Saviour and led the people astray and it was where we would all go unless Christ gave us his grace day by day. Be afraid of sin. When Satan whispers, it's only a little thing, don't listen to him. Sin is never trivial. You know, later on you get to the reign of Ahab. And he regarded the sin of Jeroboam as a trivial thing. And he outdid Jeroboam, as we will see in due course. That is disastrous. 
The last thing that I want to say this evening is this. There are some of you here this evening who may well not be, and I think I'm right in saying there are some here this evening who are still not believing in Christ. And I'm afraid for you. You're not afraid of sin, or you don't seem to be afraid of sin. You're not aware of the peril of being without Christ. I don't think I've ever seen it growing outside anywhere, but there is a, there is a plant, there is a flower that is a fly trap. I think it's called the Venus fly trap. The fly is attracted by the scent of the flower, and it rests in the flower, and it's sticky. And it can't escape, and then the plant just closes up. And the fly is devoured by the plant. There's some of you playing with sin. You're not afraid of it. You're not aware of the danger. Because if you were afraid of sin, then you would run from it and run to the Saviour, Jesus Christ, in order to be saved from your sins, in order to come under his protective arms and his protective umbrella, as it were. You should take the warnings of sin that the scripture gives us seriously. And take Christ seriously and begin to cry out that you might be saved from your sin and delivered from the wrath that is to come. You must go then to that crucified Saviour who shed his blood on the cross to atone for our sins. Don't be afraid of going to him. He will not turn you away. He will not cast you aside. Be afraid of sin, but not afraid of Christ and coming to Christ. The devil will try to say, it's no use to go to Christ. Don't listen to him. He wants to keep you away from him. Go now to Christ. Go immediately to Christ. Go directly to Christ in all your sin and cast yourself upon him. And he will save you. He will cleanse you. He will pardon you. And he will put his protective arms around you. And he will bring you to glory to be with himself. That is his promise. Oh, may God grant us grace that we may walk not in the ways of Jeroboam, but we may walk in the way of Christ, faithfully serving him who has purchased us with his own precious blood. Amen. Oh, Lord, our God, we pray that you would deliver us from our fears and from the evil inclinations and desires of our own hearts, place within us a godly fear, a true obedience and desire for your honour and your glory and your immortal praise. Grant, O oh God, that we might walk in the ways of Christ and be fruitful in every good work. Lord, deliver us from the sin of Jeroboam. Keep each one of us and keep this church true in our religion that we might not follow the devisings of men but that we might worship you in the way that you have commanded. Worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.